Now that we've put in all these hard yards with understanding how limits work and defining them carefully, um, we've now got some easy, easy low-hanging fruit that we can pick off. So the next topic that we want to have a wee look at is that of continuity. So we've all got this intuitive notion that continuity is kind of like when you take a function and so long as you can draw it without your pen losing the page or your pen leaving the page, then the function is continuous. That's kind of the notion of continuity that we got taught maybe when we first did calculus. And as far as sort of like a really good intuitive understanding of this goes, um, then that, that, that works quite nicely for understanding how continuity works. But it's not quite the right answer. It's not very rigorous. And also that we can construct some nasty examples like that sine of 1 over x, where this kind of argument breaks down, even though technically you could kind of do that. So now that we've defined limits, we are ready to move on to our definition of con continuity. Right, so here it is, the definition of continuity. Now, you'll notice it looks extremely like the definition of the limit of a function, or at least the epsilon delta version of it. Um, so we've got to, we'll have to highlight some differences as we go through because they are almost indistinguishable apart from a couple of features. So we've got a function, f, that takes some domain a onto the real numbers, and we're saying that it's continuous at a point c in the domain of a, um, if for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero, that's the same as in the limit definition, such that whenever absolute value of x minus c is less than delta, it follows that absolute value of f of x minus absolute value of f of c is less than epsilon. Okay, so at this point in time, we should probably play a little bit of spot the difference, just so we can pick out the key distinguishing features between this definition and that of a limit. Okay, first off, We'll notice that f of c appears in this definition here. In our limit one, we had a value b, okay, because we didn't actually make any assumptions about the, what the function did itself at c. We just were looking at the properties of the function as we approach c from wherever. Okay, so this is in limit, oh sorry, in continuity, but not in limits. Okay, so that's the first, the first little difference. Second one is if we were looking at the limit definition, we'd have this zero is less than absolute value of x minus c is less than delta to deal with. And again, we don't have this because um, we are actually allowed to have x equals c when we're looking at continuity. So we don't put the zero, there's no, so we'll note no zero. as x minus c is part, sorry, x equals c is part of the definition. So when we're look, dealing with continuous functions, we do care what happens at the point in question. Um, we don't just, we're not just looking at sequences of, of um, sequences of points around that point of interest. The last thing is the point c is just a point in the domain. Um, not necessarily a limit point. Okay, so with our limit definition, we require this point C to be a limit point of the domain. This time we're actually requiring it to be a member of the domain. Okay, now this is a slight technical, slight technicality, um, and we'll explore that one briefly in a minute. Okay, so there's, our there's our definition. Now it's worth um, making sure that you write down this definition perhaps alongside the um, limit one and just being really clear on what the different pieces are and how you, how you can tell one from each other. So just like with our limits, we have two different characterizations of continuity that we can use, or two main ones. And just like with limits, there's one involving epsilons and deltas, which is this one here. And there's one involving sequences, which is this one here. And again, one or other formulation may be more or less useful than the other one, depending on what you're trying to show. So this first part one is literally just our definition. So it's just a restatement of our definition. And the second one, if we think of, if we remember our sequence limit definition, we had every sequence that tended to our limit point was required to have the function value, the sequence of function values approaching the same, uh, there should be some braces, uh, some parentheses around this. Uh, we, we required the, the sequence of function values of any of these sequences to converge to that same point B. 
Okay, so here we have very much the similar, a similar thing, and it's proven exactly the same way, so I'm not going to actually prove it in this video. You can go back and look at the limit version of this proof and see if you can modify it. Um, but the characterization is if our function, if our sequence tends to C, where C is set up as before, then we require our sequence of function values to converge to F of C. So again, F of C is now appearing in our statement rather than this value B that we had as part of the setup before, because once again, we care about what's happening at the point C as well as what's happening nearby. And here's the little technicality I mentioned just before. If C is also a limit point of A, you might say, well, how can we have a point in our domain that's not a limit point? Because remember, every the examples we've looked at so far, if this was the, was the domain, and we take a point C in A, then remember it's a limit point if we can find some sequence of values that converges to it, where none of the values are equal to that point itself. The only reason, the only way in which this could not be, we could have a point in the domain that did not have a sequence like this, would be if our domain had an isolated point in it. So let's say this is our domain A, it's just one point, and which is also C. Then there's no way I can construct a sequence, because as soon as I construct a sequence tending to C, that's not allowed to be equal to C, it's going to be outside of the domain. So this says that we can have continuity at an isolated point. If, if our domain is isolated, then a function is automatically continuous at it. Again, not a big deal, not something we're really going to have to uh, contend with, but it's just one of those little weird technicalities that's worth mentioning. So functions are continuous. At isolated points of their domains. Okay, which is a weird one. Now, if, if we are in the normal case, which is when we have a domain that has some kind of size to it, and we can construct these sequences, i.e. that our point C is a limit point, then the characterization of continuity we're using is just the same as saying that the limit of the function is equal to f of c. So actually, most of the time, we can just use this um, as a definition of continuity because it's very seldom we'd actually be using, um, it's very seldom that we'd actually have to deal with these sort of edge cases where we've got isolated points. So generally speaking, if we just check that the limit as we tend to our value is equal to the f of C itself, then that's enough to show that our function is continuous at that point. Okay, the last thing I'll mention is just when we're talking about continuity, we're always talking about continuity at a particular point. So if we want to show that a function is continuous on some range of values, then we need to demonstrate that it's continuous on all of the values in the range. And last thing that's worth mentioning is it's worth saying, it's worth noting that the sequence um, characterization is really useful for proving that something is discontinuous. So let's just draw a, a function with a discontinuity in it. Again, just going on our previous understanding. So let's just have a, a jump discontinuity like this. So here's our point C. So this here is f of C. So the way, one way we can disprove that a function is continuous or show that it's discontinuous at a particular point is to find a sequence that converges to C. So here's one. So the sequence of X values will be down here. And it's converging to C. I'm going to con construct my sequence from the right so that this particular sequence converges to C uh, from the right hand side. And the corresponding sequence of function values, let's draw them maybe a different color. Is going to be converging to some other value, okay, which is not equal to f of c. So if we want to demonstrate that a function is discontinuous at a point, if we can just produce a single sequence that behaves this way, where the sequence of values converges to c, so here's our xn, uh, wrong color, let's go for red, here's our xn, which converges to c, and here's our sequence f of xn which converges to something not equal to f of c. So long as you can produce a single sequence that behaves that way, that is sufficient to disprove 
um, continuity at that point or to show the function is not continuous at that point. Remember, to be continuous, it has to be true that all sequences that converge to C have their function values converging to F of C. So to, to disprove that, you only need to find one. So let's do an example just to practice using some of these concepts. Uh, we have our function f of x equals square root of x, and we want to show that it's continuous at every point in its domain. Okay, so it's going to be all points from 0 upwards. So the way we'll go about this is we'll do our usual thing. We'll say we're going to use the epsilon delta version. So say let epsilon be greater than 0. We need to find delta such that Try that again, such that absolute value of x minus c being less than delta implies absolute value of f of x. Okay, for us, f of x is just square root of x minus square root of c is less than epsilon. Okay, so that's our challenge. We've been set a particular epsilon being positive and we need to find the corresponding value of delta so that if x is less than delta x sorry absolute value of x minus c is less than delta it follows that absolute value of square root x minus absolute value of square root c is less than epsilon now as is often the case we might get rid of the corner case or the the end point case first so if c equals zero this becomes square root of x is less than epsilon which is equivalent to x squared so x is less than epsilon squared okay i can drop the absolute values because i know i'm only working with positive values of x so i'm quite happy to just write it like this okay so all that's sort of been carried along here uh, i'll leave i'll leave them on here Okay, so what I have is x being less than epsilon squared, so we can choose delta equals epsilon squared, and then everything falls out. Okay, and you can check the rest of that yourselves, but this is just the same as any other limit type thing we've been dealing with so far. So that's dispensed with the c equals zero case. Um, that's going to be our delta. Remember, our aim is to choose delta. We've got a particular delta for one particular case, which is c equals zero. Otherwise, so I guess I should have actually said something else first. I should have said, let's c be in our domain. I was sorry, didn't define what c was. c is a point in our domain, and I've dealt with um, the c equals zero case first. Otherwise, We'll start with this x, this is a yeah, little scrap working area. If we start with this square root of absolute value of x minus square root of absolute value of c, we need to turn this somehow into something involving x minus c so that we can choose our delta relative to this. Okay, so a good, a good strategy when we have problems involving square roots is quite possibly going to be to multiply by square root of x plus square root of c and see what happens. So that is going to be equal to absolute value of square root of x minus square root of c times square root of x plus square root of c over square root of x plus square root of c, which will overall get us, I can bring, notice that these are positive things, so I could put absolute values around them if I wanted to, but it wouldn't really do, do much, but I can bring combine those two absolute values together into one, and so that will become the absolute value of x minus c over absolute value of square root of x plus the square root of c. Okay, but remember, I can just I just want to find some kind of bound here that doesn't depend on this x. Everything's fine except that I have an x here, so I can't go and choose delta is equal to whatever it is, root c plus root x times epsilon, because that won't work. So remember, there's kind of this less than epsilon in the background here. So I just want to find a larger fraction that I can insert in between here that doesn't involve x on the bottom like this. So I want it to be square root of x, absolute value of x minus c over something or other constant. So we'll just 
observe that we have two positive numbers on the bottom of our fraction here. If I were to take 1 over 8, for example, that equals 1 over 4, let's make it 1 over 5 plus 3. They're both positive numbers. If I want to get a bigger fraction, I can just take one of them out. That's less than 1 over 5, right? Um, an eighth is smaller than a fifth. Hopefully we're all happy with that. So here, I can make, I can say that there is going to be less than absolute value of x minus c divided by the square root of c. I've just taken out one positive number, just like I took out the 3 down here. And so if I choose, and so that will go in between here. That's, that's how I'm going to set it up. So if I just bring this root c up onto the epsilon, and then I can choose that as my delta. So otherwise we'll choose delta is equal to epsilon root c. Okay, so we're following our typical template. We've fixed the epsilon greater than zero. We have a c in our domain that's non-zero. Um, we've written down what we need, this delta here. We've chosen a delta, and now we just need to make sure that our logic is correct, and we need to demonstrate that if absolute value of x minus c is less than delta, it follows, everything else follows. So, if the absolute value of x minus c is less than delta, then let's just replace that delta. Absolute value of x minus c is less than epsilon root c. Okay, and now I'm just going to look over at my right-hand side here. Then if absolute value of x minus c is less than epsilon root c, 